I must say, graduates, you're in for a real treat. I've known Cyrus for several years, and I'm always filled with awe and wonder when I hear him speak. At just 31 years old, Cyrus has mastered skills to bypass his blindness and build an amazing life that knows no boundaries. At the age of eight, he completely lost his eyesight to cancer, but nonetheless went on to become a black belt in karate, a jazz pianist, a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, an editor of the Law Review at Yale, a patent attorney at the prestigious Seattle-based firm Perkins Coie, where he works on licensing and technology for startup IT companies. Last year, he was elected to represent Bellevue's 48th district, and even as a freshman legislator, Cyrus's star continues to rise. Please welcome your 2013 commencement speaker, the Honorable Cyrus Habib. Thank you. <laughs> Chancellor Floten, Dr. Smith, mentors and faculty members, friends and family, and of course, graduates, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today for your commencement ceremony. It's a true honor. And I want to thank you in particular, not only for giving me the chance to stand up here on the stage of the beautiful and historic Benaroya Hall, but also for inviting me to play the piano, something I haven't had a chance to do regularly for, for many, many years, and which goes to show that um, in some areas, at least, you can still fake it till you make it. Uh, so it's an honor to be playing um, the Steinway piano today as well. But before I do that, I want to just share a few thoughts um, and, and observations that I have about Western Governors University in my own life and how I think in some ways we have much in common. Um, as Chancellor Floten mentioned, um, I lost my eyesight at a young age, but my American story starts even earlier than that. My parents came to the United States from Iran um, when that country had a very, very different political, cultural, and religious complexion than it does now. They came here as so many Americans do in search of religious freedom, search of political uh, uh, freedom and liberties, in search of economic opportunities, and above all, for access to our wonderful educational institutions, of which WGU Washington is one of the most recent contributions. My father went to the University of Washington, my mother to the University of Maryland, where she got her law degree. I was born in Maryland, and soon after my birth, I was diagnosed in my left eye with a rare form of childhood cancer called retinoblastoma, which is about as scary as it sounds. I lost eyesight in my left eye very, very young, and despite the best efforts of the physicians and uh, professors at Johns Hopkins University, I ended up losing eyesight in my right eye, making me completely blind at the age of eight. Now, that was in the 1980s, which means that according to all my visual memories, everyone in this room still looks like Cyndi Lauper and Boy George. So, at that time, we, we moved uh, in search of um, uh, a great quality of life that this state offers. My parents moved back to the Seattle area, and I grew up in Bellevue, which I have the honor of representing in the state legislature, along with my colleague, Representative Maxwell, who's here today. But as I think about all of the things that Chancellor Floten so generously mentioned in the arc of my life and how I ended up standing before you, and I think about WGU, Three things come to mind in particular as common lessons that we share. The first, first of those is get up on the monkey bars. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you a story, and Chancellor Floten's heard me tell this one before, but I'm going to repeat it now because this is at the kernel of my life. The reason why, despite losing my eyesight, I was able to move courageously forward in life, and it's because Soon after moving to Washington State, I was a third grader, I was in the third grade at Somerset Elementary School, and as you all know, kids like to go out at recess time and lunch time and play on the jungle gym up on the monkey bars, even here in rainy Seattle. So my school was no exception, and so all the kids would go out and play on the jungle gym, play on the monkey bars, and 
Uh, I think knowing that my mother is a lawyer uh, and that I had recently become blind, the school was not too excited about my joining them. <laughs> and they had good lawyers there at the Bellevue School District. But what they did was they kept me by the side of the school with the recess monitors while all the other kids were playing during recess. And anyone who knows anything about moving across the country 3,000 miles away from your old friends or about having cancer and being um, in, uh, in a hospital bed when other kids are at a Halloween party um, or anything about being different and having a disability knows how isolating each of those experiences is. And so this was the final straw for me. I went home and I told my parents what had happened that day at school and my parents were as frustrated as I was. And my mother took me with her to the school to learn how to become an advocate for myself. She took me to the school and she went to the school principal and she said, I'm gonna take my son to the school on the weekends and I'm gonna teach him how to get around the monkey bars. I'm gonna teach him how to get around the jungle gym and he's gonna learn it as well as any other kid. She said, you know, it may happen that he may slip and fall and he may even slip and fall and break his arm. That's a fear that any mother has. But then she said, I can fix a broken arm, I can never fix a broken spirit. That became my life philosophy. So that whether it was learning martial arts or how to downhill ski, or learning my way around the New York Metro when I went to college in Manhattan, or learning to move to Guatemala on my own to study Spanish, or to even become a photographer, I learned never to let someone hold me back from the monkey bars. Now what's important about that is when my parents realized that I was gonna lose my eyesight, they made a pact to one another, which I only found out about recently. The pact they made to each other was, we will never let our fear become his fear. So what's important is in life, that taught me we have to embrace risk. Of course, we all may slip and fall and break an arm. Every one of the clients I work with at my law firm, when they go out and start a new business, they may fail. They do that knowing they may fail, but yet they get up on the monkey bars and they take that risk. Each of you who are now taking your undergraduate and graduate degrees out into this workforce, out into this economy which is so uncertain, each of you faces those risks. And the important thing to remember always, which I've carried with me since that day on the playground, is that though we do, we do experience risk and there's always the, the, the possibility that we may slip and fall and break our arm, we're gonna get back up with our spirits intact. That was the first lesson I learned. And I think WGU uniquely positioned and has positioned each of you to go out there and get up on the monkey bars and take those risks. And I'm so excited for you. The second shared lesson is the lesson of the ant and the peacock. The ant and the peacock. Why would I mention these two creatures in particular? Well, this is where I, I'm gonna take the privilege because I know you're all fresh from studying your, your undergraduate and graduate studies to get into a little bit of evolutionary biology. I know you weren't expecting this today on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. But the ant and the peacock are two creatures that have long confounded evolutionary biologists and in fact confounded Darwin himself. Why? Because the peacock it, it defies natural selection in one important way. The more colorful the feathers of the peacock are, the more vulnerable he is to prey. Yet, somehow the more colorful the feathers of the peacock are, the more attractive he is to a mate. And they've not been able to understand that because natural selection would suggest camouflage. The ant has confounded evolutionary biologists because evolutionary biologists say that above all, you're supposed to look out for yourself. Altruism doesn't make sense to an evolutionary biologist, the idea that you would work for the good of the whole. Well, what's important about my life and about the work that you're, you all are doing, what can we learn from the peacock and the ant? Well, it turns out that there's a solution to these two problems. The solution to these two problems was discovered and written about recently, about 10 years ago. The solution to the peacock is that there is actually in nature 
a preference for creatures who overcome difficult obstacles. And then in fact, if you can show and demonstrate strength in the face of adversity, you actually have shown a survival instinct far more powerful than is otherwise found in nature. So, in my life, for example, having experienced something as debilitating as blindness at a young age, when I decided to run for office, there were many, many, many people, including in the, my own political party, including friends and advisors, who said, you know, Cyrus, how are you ever gonna do this? How are you ever gonna go around and doorbell and meet voters? Because we go around and you knock on people's doors and interrupt their dinners and they're watching TV or whatever it is, and that's how we introduce ourselves. And they said, how are you gonna do that, Cyrus? How are you gonna do it if you're blind? And so we said, well, uh, you know, I, I, I said, you know, I've, I've lived in New York, I've taken the metro subway on my own, I've taken, uh, you know, I've lived in Guatemala on my own, why do you think this is going to be such an obstacle? And they said, well, but we've never seen someone do it before. Well, I went out and I did it, and we found creative ways to get it done, but ultimately what people told me later was, we remembered you because you're never going to forget the blind guy who shows up at your doorstep, <laughs> right? So that's how you make a perceived weakness into a strength. And I know from the stories I've heard, some of the graduates here, that you all know that story as well, if not better than I do. You know, we, we just heard about the diversity in this group. Again, it's that diversity, that difference that you can make into a strength. What can we learn from the ant? Well, what we can learn from the ant is best summed up in a sign that if you drive down I-5 towards Vancouver, Washington, you'll see this sign. I think this is brilliant. It says, you're not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Our responsibilities are shared as a colony. We are all, in that sense, we have much to learn from each other. And so, as each of you leaves today, you know that you didn't achieve this phenomenal uh, d graduation, this commencement day on your own. Uh, I, I often say to, to people, when I explain my political philosophy, I always say, the easiest thing in the world for me would be to say, you know what, I did it on my own. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, and if I can do it, anyone can do it. And, you know, think about, uh, think about how proud of myself I would feel, how good about myself I would feel if I could say that it was all done on my own. The only problem is, I know that's not true. I know that I learned how to read books, borrowing Braille books and talking audio books from the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library, staying up way, way past my bedtime. Um, I learned how to use a cane, which, by the way, in my campaign photos, people thought was me wearing sunglasses holding a golf club. <laughs> uh, I learned how to use that cane to get around from the Department of Services for the Blind. Okay, I learned how to use computer software that reads me my emails and Facebook and Twitter. I learned that from the Washington State School for the Blind down in Vancouver. So I understand that everything I've done in my life has been on the backs of the work of other people. And I think you all know that as well, which is why it's so wonderful to have an institution like this for the next generation. And I challenge you, once you leave with your graduate and undergraduate degrees in hand, every year you think about this, which is that for those of you getting an undergraduate degree, you're in the one-third of adults in this country who have a college degree. Only one-third. This despite the fact that by the end of this decade, 70% of our jobs will require one. So now you have a responsibility to think like an ant. You have a responsibility to realize that there's such a thing as indirect fitness, not just direct fitness, and to look out for society as a whole and help those other two-thirds to achieve their dreams as well. And for those of you getting a graduate degree, you're part of the 6% of this country who has a graduate degree. So each of you are leaders in a scholastic community and those who have the opportunity to help others if you think like an ant and also think like a peacock. So the third final thing I wanna leave with you is that you know when you lose your eyesight at a young age, you learn the importance of two things more than any others the importance of hard work and creative solutions, okay? I mean, whether it's, for me, whether it's figuring out which tie goes with which suit, whether it's figuring out how to tell a $5 bill from a $10 bill, 
or how to get to work every day, all of those require hard work and creativity. No institution of higher education in the state of Washington instills those values more than WGU. We have a history of higher education in the West that goes back a millennium. And that system of higher education has changed from monastic tutorials to lecture halls to land-grant universities. And this is the latest chapter. WGU, it's no surprise, was founded by Western governors because we are pioneers out here as we think about what the 21st century is going to look like. And you all, you're not guinea pigs, you're leaders as we think about how to work hard and think creatively to keep the cost of education low so it's accessible to everyone, to keep the quality, quality of education high as we test for competence, not just ticking off minutes on a clock, and as we work together to imagine a 21st century America where every person has access to higher education. And so we're gonna need your hard work and creativity as we do that for others in Washington State. So, on behalf of all my colleagues in the state legislature, I want you to know how proud of you we are, how much we think about you down in Olympia, how much we see you as a beacon of hope in these very, very difficult times when it seems like how are we going to achieve so much with so little, with such shrinking budgets and growing needs. We think of WGU Washington as a model we want to replicate, we want to grow. And please, be available for us. We're going to call on you and ask you for your thoughts and feedback and leadership as we try to roll that out more. Thank you for the tremendous honor of being here with you today, and congratulations.